good morning. And good Friday morning too. It is a good day. It's good Friday because of the great thing that Jesus Christ did for us. I want to read to you about that from Isaiah. The prophet, uh, well over 700 years before it took place, spoke about what Jesus Christ would do for us. And he said, See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there are many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a tender shoot, and like a root out of the dry ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep upon a stray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can, stand, who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and, and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see the offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquity. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the greats, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, it is a great privilege to gather together today. Father, on this Good Friday, 2022, we remember again the blood that was shed, the body that was broken, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as the prophet reminds us, by his wounds we are healed. We thank you, Father, for the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. We pray that the good news of Jesus will be shared here in this community, and in this province, and in this nation, and in this world, because we know, Lord, as we share that good news of Jesus Christ, people are saved by the Savior, that people's lives are changed for eternity. We thank you, Father, for the change that you've made in our lives. We pray for those around us that haven't bowed their knee to Jesus. We pray, Father, that you'll draw them to yourself and that you'll give us the privilege of sharing your good news with all people. For we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' precious name. Well, it is our privilege to lead you in uh, worshiping this morning. Uh, we encourage you to stand with us if you're able, and we're going to lead you in some songs of praise.
line in the song that stands out to me is uh, it's about the defeat of death and the victory of life through the love of Jesus Christ. Love has won, death has lost. It is finished. 
With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He has done it. He has won the victory for us. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah.
we give you glory. We pray, Father, that this offering will rise up to you like a pleasant to home. It will be a sacrifice of praise that gives you glory. Lord, we pray for our brother Neil. We thank you for him. We thank you for his heart to serve you. We pray, Father, that you will use him as your minister of the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, open our hearts and our minds and open our eyes, Lord, that we might behold wonderful things from your law. For we thank you, we praise you in Jesus' precious name.
that could possibly be done, a depiction of the real torture and suffering of the man Jesus as he was put to death. And the world looked at that and said, what is this obsession with gore and bloodiness that Christians would subject themselves to this, and even their children, as though there was some virtue in watching torture? What is the point of it all? Well, it's, it's an interesting question, isn't it? It's an interesting question that we who gather here in the name of Christ commemorates something which the world cannot understand when we commemorate his death. And you can't really understand it or maybe even understand why they can't understand it if you are in faith, unless you appreciate that this actually looks kind of absurd from the outside. The songs we just sung, which touched my heart, seem kind of absurd from the outside. I worked in Jerusalem for a year as a, uh, an envoy to the United States Security Coordinator for Peace in the Middle East, Commissioner for the Oslo Accords, I worked in Palestine and Israel. I actually lived right beside Damascus Gate uh, in Jerusalem, which is the old city. I would often walk past the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on my way to work. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, if you don't know, is that traditional site of the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, it is a place where all of the churches, except the Protestants who decided they knew better and found another place and called that the place where Jesus was crucified, uh, where all of the other churches say, this is our holiest of holy sites. And pilgrims from all over the world come and they walk. As you go through the front doors of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, there is a steep staircase on the right-hand side which you can walk up, and there's a big line, and you can walk and wait and eventually come to the place where you can put your hands in what is supposedly the post hole for the cross upon which Jesus was crucified. And people are in tears and weeping with emotional overload and being able to touch that spot. And it is a place that is so important in the religious practice Christians or nominal Christians all around the world. <laughs> and I remember an event which was all too common there when I was uh, in Jerusalem in November of 2015, when the Orthodox monks and the Armenian monks uh, led their processions into one another in a dispute over who had the rights to be leading a procession that day, and ended up in a fist fight that spilled over until the whole region of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was just filled with men punching each other in the face. You can look it up, there's video of it everywhere. Uh, November 2015, fist fight in the Holy Sepulchre. The Israeli police had to come in and beat the monks down with the dons to get them off each other and cease this unrest and disturbance. Looks utterly nonsensical because it is. There's a ludicrous nature to that fixation and that religiosity which is going on there. So what in the world is this all about? Because if you want to just step back for a second and look at this, when the world looks at the life of Christ, you can find all kinds of scholars that are going to look for the historical Jesus. I remember Time did a special publication a number of years back, I think it was around about Easter time, which they wanted to look for the historical Christ. And they had all of these experts who came in and they gave their opinions on who the historical Christ was. But just taking the scriptures from the perspective of one who is trying to understand the historical Christ, take a minute and understand what it is that they see. They see that there was a man 
born to a relatively unimportant Jewish family sometime around 3 to 4 BC. That there was a bunch of stuff which supposedly happened around his birth which seemed kind of significant. Some foreign magicians and <laughs> you know, pagan sorcerers showed up and gave him some money because they saw some signs in the sky. Uh, maybe the king of Israel at that time was afraid that he was going to supplant him and try to have him killed. Uh, he, however, after those events, seems to have just basically faded into obscurity for about 30 years of his life. And then his cousin, who was a really significant prophet in that day, uh, a wild man in the desert, baptized him. The people reported hearing a voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, and some sort of spiritual uh, evidence from heaven that looked like a dove resting upon him. And then he began to teach. And he taught stuff that we generally, whether we believe in Christ or not, think is pretty good stuff. Love each other. Stop fighting. Act sacrificially towards one another. The thing that God actually wants from you is a life that is devoted in love towards one another. And he does this and it upsets the religious figures of his day, particularly because he's basically telling them that their traditions are not right. He even goes so far as to uh, minimize the Sabbath, which is a law given directly from the hand of God to Moses as they see it, and to suggest that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. And they, they don't like him very much. He's teaching the wrong things. But even worse, he starts to call them out on their hypocrisy. And even worse than that, he seems to have claimed that he was the son of God, which of course is blasphemy, if it's not true. And everything comes to a head in Jerusalem when Christ comes and the people thinking he's this prophesied deliverer called the Messiah, that they rejoice and, and they become overjoyed that this man is coming, thinking perhaps that he is going to deliver them from the oppression that they face under the Romans. And a week passes and this man meets with his disciples for a last time and one of them goes off and betrays him to the religious figures that want to kill him. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, having had a last meal with his disciples, having eaten with them, given them a commemoration for his death, which he tells them is imminent, prays for them, falls into a mortal terror, which is recorded in scripture, and despair so great that he can barely walk, stumbles and falls upon his face, and begins in agony to pray for help and strength. That's what's recorded in Scripture. A very mortal man facing what he's certain is a terrible torment and death. And then one of his closest friends betrays him, meets him in that garden, hands him over for payment to those who would seek to kill him. He is taken, he is beaten, he is mocked, ridiculed, spat upon, falsely accused, in a court of religious authority, they drag him before a judge. That judge, who is a Roman authority, considers him perfectly innocent of any wrongdoing or crime, appeals to the people to let him go. This has nothing to do with me. The people want him dead. So he has him beaten nearly to death in a thing called scourging, which we know of in great detail from uh, contemporary scholars, in which a whip is taken with multiple strands with either bone or pottery fragments or more often even iron nails that are braided into it to rip the skin, the muscle from the back of the one being scourged. It was so brutal, according to contemporary scholars, that about half didn't actually survive to be executed who were subjected to that. And he did this to the man, hoping to satiate the blood thirstiness of this crowd that wanted him dead. The same people who a week earlier had said, he's our deliverer. No, crucify him. So the same judge who says, well, 
you're innocent of everything. I don't consider you to be worthy of death. He says, well, I'm going to have him killed anyway just to shut these people up. And so this good teacher, Grace, he's unjustly put to death in a very cruel way by crucifixion. He can't even walk to his own execution site because he's so wounded. Carrying his cross, he stumbles, and another man is pressed to take it there. And then he's placed upon the cross, nails put into his hand and feet. And of course, you've probably heard the story of how this works, but if you don't know, crucifixion is pretty rough, especially after you've been scourged. Because now you've been placed against this rough wooden cross, so that the bare flesh and torn muscles of your back are against the rough wood of that cross. So your foot is nailed to a plank at an incline, and you're hung there so that you slowly suffocate until the need to breathe forces you to push up on your feet in order to gain a full measure of breath. But in doing so, you rub the raw flesh of your back off of the cross, and you're forced into a stress position that you can't possibly hold for any length of time until you hang on your arms again and begin to suffocate. And the torture goes on until you die, ultimately, of either the injuries you received uh, in the scourging or the suffocation or, or whatever. It's pretty brutal. <clears throat> and this man, this teacher, ostensibly, dies rather quickly, actually, for crucifixion. According to, you know, the world scholars, he must have been pretty wounded from his beating and probably died of internal injuries because it was fairly normal for someone crucified to last three days on the cross before they died. But in his case, he died within a day. And he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Said it is finished, he gave up his spirit and died. That's the story. And we gather here to remember that. But you realize that to the world, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And you know why? Because <laughs> despite the way in which we have so often reverently gone over the details and gruesome aspects of Christ's death, it really isn't that special. Do you realize that during the rebellion of Spartacus, 6,000 slaves were captured, the Appian Way, which is 200 kilometers long, was a place where they, in a single line, crucified 6,000 captured slaves. So, in the same manner of death which Jesus died, 6,000 slaves died. That is the equivalent, by the way, for reference, I, I did the Google map search, from this point to Quispam Sis is 99.86 kilometers. Imagine every 33 meters, it's about every 60 paces, on the highway, all the way to Quispam Sis, somebody on the side of the road being executed exactly the same way that Jesus was. And all the way back again. That's how many people in one sitting the Romans did this to. It doesn't make it nice, but it does make it not very unique. In fact, if we're going to be honest, the way Jesus died is not even really the most gruesome way in which men have died in the world. There have been more inventive tortures even than the Romans imagined, uh, some of them even invented by supposedly Christian medieval torturers. There have been ways invented to keep a man alive in utter torments for years before killing them. So what makes this so special? It's not the fact that Jesus died in a brutal fashion, he did, but that isn't why we're here to celebrate because a man who was a good teacher died. We're here to celebrate something which is far more important than that. And it's the thing that the world can't explain. Because in trying to cast Jesus as this strange man, Jewish man from 2,000 years ago, who taught some good things and was killed for it, the world fundamentally cannot explain 
the impact that his death has had upon the world. It is an absolutely unique thing. <clears throat> Although there are many men whose teaching has had a significant impact on the world, name one whose death is celebrated as having transformed the lives of countless untold millions of people, whose death by its celebration defeated the Roman Empire, transformed the world across all generations and across all cultures in every place that it has been presented and preached, it has fundamentally altered those societies. What is it about the death of Christ that stands apart from every other man's death? Because it is not that it was brutal. It is not that it was a wicked thing done to a, a, a good man. I mean, scouring my brain to try and think of one person whose death is in any sense celebrated, you might come up with, I don't know, Socrates. As, as one who is not celebrated for having died as a wicked man, but celebrated, in some sense, for having stood by his values and died. And what do we get from Socrates? Did he transform the world by his death? No, like, basically we get, you know, it's kind of a good idea to ask questions as a way of teaching people. <laughs> that's, that's about it. Like, his life and his teaching has come forward, um, if we actually, if you look hard at what Socrates actually taught, it would not be appreciated in our modern world, okay, uh, nor in our Christian world. Um, but his death stands as an example, perhaps, of standing by your principles, but no one says that he transformed the world by it, or that he transforms lives even today by it. And the lives of men like Muhammad and Joseph Smith, although they brought forward a remarkable religion into the world, it isn't by their death, it's by their promise of prosperity and even hedonism in this life and the next. And their very successful lives of enjoying that in themselves, right up to a relatively peaceful end that has drawn people to them. But Christ taught this stuff and died for it with nobody around him, and as a result of his death, the world was transformed. What is it about? Well, Hebrews 2 is where we hear the story that is really being told on Good Friday. We look at Hebrews 2, starting at verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, actually, I'm in the wrong place here, uh, starting in verse 9. Hebrews 2, starting in verse 9 we read, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name in the midst of my brothers, in the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise, and again I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, he himself likewise took take, partook of the same things, that through his death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through the fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, 
He is able to help those who are being tempted. Not there yet. But let's break it down. What Hebrews 2 here is telling us is that Good Friday is important not because a man died in a gruesome way, but because of who died, because of why he suffered, and because of what he accomplished in his death. Because of who died, because of why he suffered, and because of what he accomplished by his death. So who was it that died? The world says a good teacher. That makes no sense. It doesn't answer anything about what the power of his death has been in the world. It doesn't answer anything about the proclaimed experience of millions of people across all cultures have to say about what this has done for them when they have trusted in it. And as I have said, Yes, on the scale of 1 to 10 of horrible deaths, where one is dying peacefully in your bed surrounded by loved ones, and 10 is somewhere around where ISIS and Boko Haram get a hold of you and murder and rape and hurt your family members in front of you before doing the same thing to you, or where you get to spend a year in a concentration camp being brutalized, mentally tormented, and violated until you're staked out over cut bamboo that slowly grows up through your body and kills you. It's not actually the worst, but it's rough. But it isn't about how bad it was. It's about who it was done to. And according to this text, the scripture received from God, the person of Jesus who was tormented on the cross and killed was made for a little while, little while lower than the angels. What does that mean? That he was made for a little while lower than the angels. It means that before and after, he was above the angels. That is the claim of Christianity, and it is the evidence of Christianity. What does it mean that he was above the angels? Who is this person? that somehow existed before he was a man and was made temporarily beneath the angels so that he might be exalted above the angels again. Well, according to this text, it says that in accordance with God's will, it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect in suffering. There's two people being talked about here. One of them is the founder of their salvation, that's Christ. Who is it for whom and by whom all things are made? Well, clearly that's God, the Father, right? And yet, if you go back to chapter 1 of Hebrews, you'll read this in verse 2. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the power of his words. So if God the Father made all things, <laughs> and he made all things through his Son, Jesus Christ, and all things are sustained by the power of the Word of Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus Christ? He is God. Amen. Amen. He is God. He is not the Father in person. He is the Father in substance. They are one. And God sent his Son, who was God himself, to clothe himself in humanity to become a creation in this fallen world, creating himself according to his own power, since he was the agent of creation in the Godhead, and sustaining not only his own flesh by his own power, but the flesh of every man who would turn against him and kill him. Amen. This is who died on the cross. That matters. 
It is not just a guy who taught some good things. It is God himself who died. Consider something for a second. There's a neat thing about matter. I don't know if you know this, but matter seems not to exist. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, if you get into it, we just keep diving and diving and diving deeper and deeper and deeper into the structure of stuff, stuff that exists, matter. And you know what? We keep finding nothing. <laughs> we keep finding more nothing. And we keep finding that every particle, no matter how close we look, is actually made up of more particles that don't actually touch each other. <laughs> and then we dive into those and, and we find ultimately that it seems, according to quantum physics and observations of, of uh, particle colliders, that everything is actually just energy that is constrained by these things called physical constants to act in an orderly way, perfectly, synchronistically, opposing positive and negative energies with attractive forces that force these energies that are naturally chaotic into some sort of order that allows it to formulate what appears to be matter. And that everything is actually not really there in some sense. Do you know the physical constants which force this order upon matter and energy to make it matter? They don't exist. They are not in themselves material. And there is nothing inside of the material world which seems to dictate how they could operate or force this on the reality that we exist in. That's that's what we're learning from science. <laughs> and of course, scientists have said, well, how does this work? I don't know. And it's really problematic because it basically means it's infinitely impossible for there to have been a universe that's spontaneously created in such a fine way that it would allow matter to exist. So, then you get multiverse to try and explain it. Well, we must have an infinite number of opportunities because it's the only way to explain any reality in which it's possible for atoms to even form as the building blocks of creation. No, the force that constrains and forces order upon chaotic energy to make this world is Jesus. It is the power of his word that sustains all things. That is who died on the cross, is the person who forces by his will creation into being every nanosecond of its existence. Yeah, what a thing. That's not the same thing as some teacher that said some good stuff, died 2,000 years ago. It's remarkable. It's an upheaval of the cosmic balance that he ever existed as a man. The fact of Jesus Christ in itself is, is a cosmic imbalance. The Creator became created in order to get into relationship with his own creation. And we killed him. That's the story. Why? What did it accomplish? What is the point of the suffering and torture of the being who forces creation to exist? What is the point of that? Why would we celebrate it? Well, why Jesus suffers is also answered in this text. Some people look at this and they say, the story you're telling is actually awful. You've painted this God that you love, but he's a moral monster. What is the point? He sent his son into the world so that he might torture him, have him tortured by, by these vicious creations that had gone haywire? Like, what's the point of that? It's actually evil. Your God is evil. He, 
let people torture his son. He actually sent him, according to you, to be tortured. <laughs> and you yourselves say that this was unjust. So obviously the father is not just, yeah? They don't understand, of course, that there was a divine and great purpose behind why Jesus had to suffer. Do you know that there is a thing that the British royalty does where the princes have to serve in the military? So, Prince Charles was a pilot, and he was a uh, destroyer captain after that. He spent quite a few years in the Air Force and in the Navy. And Prince William uh, served as first a a cavalry officer, and then he became a Sea King helicopter pilot. And he joined Search and Rescue, and he served in Search and Rescue as an active pilot for a year and a half. And Prince Harry became a, an infantry officer after being a cavalry officer first, served in Afghanistan and Helmand in 2007 and 2008, same time I was uh, around there, and let me tell you, it was a pretty dangerous place to be. He actually fought in engagements as a forward air controller. He fought in engagements with the Gurkha troops he was attached to, and actually got shot at by Taliban. The royal family sent him there to do that. And then he went back as an Apache pilot, and fought as a, an Apache pilot for another 10-week uh, period before the media blew his cover and they had to pull him out. And he was getting shot at and shooting back in turn. And frankly, you know anything about helicopters? Um, I'm not sure who had the more dangerous job, William being a seeking pilot, or uh, Harry getting shot at by Taliban. <laughs> I think I'd take Harry's job. Why would the royal family do that? What is the point? of making their sons go and serve in dangerous jobs. It's of course in order that they may understand their people, that they may share in the sufferings of their people, that they can know what it is they're asking people to do in their name. And it's still true in Britain and in Canada that if you're in the army, your oath is sworn towards the queen or the king, should we get a king. It's not towards the government of Canada or the government of Britain but to the actual sovereign. And if the sovereign is going to take an oath of service of other men, up to and including death, then you better know what that means. And they understand that, and so they send their sons to go and to experience it for themselves and to understand what they're asking of their people. Yeah? And this, according to Hebrews 2, is what God has done to his son that these creations of of gods, of the sons, have rebelled and brought upon themselves terrible hardship, broken this creation, created what is a precursor of hell in existence in the way that we torment one another. Those horrible means of death I just described, we are terrible people, humans, terrible beings. And yet God wanted to save us, but he saw that Christ, who was perfect eternally outside of history, needed, in order to be a perfect Savior, to come and to be one of us, to suffer like us, to endure hardships, betrayals, vicious maltreatment, disappointment, grief, loss, just like us, to know death intimately in loved ones and in his self. You understand something? Yes. By his wounds we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. Robert read that earlier from Isaiah 53. But according to Hebrews 2, yes, Christ's suffering is part of his redemptive work. But the purpose of his suffering was so that he might be made a perfect high priest 
offering propitiation for our sins. A high priest offering propitiation. Well, let me get to that in a second. It is so that he could know us and love us. Now, if you can for a second understand that the King of Heaven, who sustains your being even now by the word of his power, who forces chaotic energy into matter by his will, came to earth to die and to be tormented, to be betrayed, abandoned by his closest friends in his hour of need, to be beaten, mocked, ridiculed, spat upon, taken by the soldiers after he was unjustly condemned to death, to have a crown of thorns pressed upon his head and a purple robe wrapped around him and beaten about the head repeatedly with sticks by men who thought it was really funny that he was going to die. Do you think for a second that the reason he did that was for you and for me, so that he could know us. That is the story of Good Friday, that Christ suffered, so that in anything which you suffer, he understands. He has been tempted with every temptation that you have ever faced. Although he did not sin, he understands the burden of temptation. He has lost loved ones as you have lost loved ones. He has been physically tormented by pain to such a degree that he could not stand. His flesh was violated by men who thought destroying him and taking what was sacred to him was funny. So that whenever you suffer, he can stand with you as your brother and say, I understand, and I love you, and I will walk with you through this. I will give you my strength. I get it. I was there. There is no experience that man can endure, which Jesus Christ did not subject himself to, so that he might walk with you through it. That is why he suffered. That is what Good Friday is about. And more than that, it is what he accomplished in his death, which is said here that he defeated him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and that in so doing, he delivered from the fear of death all of those held in slavery to sin. He delivers from slavery to sin those who are wretched. What did Christ accomplish in his death? As I just said, it says here that he is the high priest, perfect in mercy, as he makes propitiation for your sin. What does that even mean? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that Jesus Christ made himself your brother in suffering in every hardship of human experience so that he could stand and make sacrifice of himself in your place to turn the wrath of God away from you onto himself and offer his own perfect and sinless life on your behalf. That is what it means. I'll tell you a story. It's gross. So I was uh, an infantry officer in training once. We did this exercise right here in Gagetown for 14 days. And in 14 days, we had no opportunity to shower. And it was July, and it was real hot. And we had, I had two pairs of combats because we didn't have enough clothes for everybody at the time even have the standard issue three. So in 14 days I wore the same two pairs of clothes with no opportunity to wash them, uh, working about 20 hours a day uh, doing
combat attacks and patrols. Now, if you've never done that kind of thing, you sweat kind of a lot. And your sweat's kind of gross because uh, you're eating bagged food that is laced with sulfites that was canned somewhere between five and ten years ago. Because they always give the trainees the stuff that's expired and been extended year after year so that they don't have to throw it away. Right? And uh, your sweat stinks of sulfur because of all the sulfur you're eating, which is the preservative in the food. And moreover, you're eating bags of mostly liquid food with this long, wobbly, white plastic spoon that breaks real easy. And you gotta scoop all the way to the bottom of this bag of ham steak or uh, stew or whatever it is, and then try to lever it up into your mouth. And inevitably, everybody is just caked with food ooze in short order. And after 14 days of sweating, constantly being wet, that food ooze is literally rotting in your clothes. I remember, after that particular exercise, clear in my mind, coming into my room in the H lines, H1, where I shared with four other dudes, peeling these sticky, gross, stenchiest, imaginable things off of my flesh. I'm tossing it in the corner where it literally stuck to the wall. And I went to the shower and I showered and I came back and I could barely stand suddenly the stench of my own clothes that I had just taken off. And so I, with my towel wrapped around me, went and tossed them in the washing machine, went back, went to the little cabinet above the door, pulled out my bag of civilian clothes, took out clean underwear, shorts, and my blue Hawaiian t-shirts. <laughs> and I put that on, light, clean, dry, and bounty fresh. And I can still feel and smell the sudden cleanness of that. It's strange the things your memory holds on to. Now I want you to just take that picture for a second and understand that Christ died without having added one blemish to his life. You and I have spilled juicy ration food all over our garments and sweated vile stenchy sweat into our, our clothes of righteousness. You and I have done wretched things. I probably more than you. But we hurt people and we hurt ourselves by our sin. We do things which we despise and we can never undo them. Our clothes are vile, stenchy rags. And when we go to death, we will be confronted by the living God. And if we walk into the presence of the Father, reeking of the stench of death and sin, we will be cast out of his presence. But Jesus took his perfect life into the presence of death and the Father, and now he stands there and says, give me your rags, and he will let you peel the stench-covered rags of your unrighteousness from your flesh, and he will place it upon his own body, and he will wash you clean in the power of his own blood, cleanse you from all of the stink and grime and slime of your life, and he will give you his own garments, unstained by any blemish, clean and downy fresh, so that you can walk into the audience of the living God and stand in his righteousness. 
That's what it means that he is a high priest who makes propitiation for you and me. He offers of himself his own life for us. And he, as the creator, has the righteous authority to do that for all men. It is only a question of whether or not you and I will take up his clothes and put on the white robes that he gives us freely to everyone who asks, or whether we will demand to go into judgment, standing on our own unrighteousness, and be cast in our stench righteously out of the presence of the source of life and all goodness. It is not a man who dies. It is the living God himself in the person of the Son, forever united in perfect unity with the Father and the Spirit of the triune God, through whom all things have their being, who died and suffered so that he might know us, and died so that he might give of his own perfect life to save us. It is the case that Jesus himself said this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that who, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged, he who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. There really is no dispute. The historians give you their stories. Understand something. Their historical Jesus is based on absolutely nothing more than their own imagination. There literally are no source texts for them to draw upon except this one. In the first person account, witnesses of everyone who saw him, who claimed him to be able to make miraculous healing of the blind, of the lame, of the demon possessed and insane, the constantly thrown into seizure, and to have walked perfectly and to have died without sin, and to have risen from the dead. They imagine a Jesus of their pure fantasy that is based in nothing more than their unwillingness to accept that the reason that Christ's death has transformed the world is because he is the living Son of God. It's not a question of proof. It's a question of will you walk into the light? Will you receive the free gift of salvation? Will you repent of your sin and take off your filthy clothes and accept the clean righteousness that he offers in your place? Not of your work, but of his own work freely offered in his death. That is Good Friday's message. Yes, it was brutal, but it was absolutely unequals in that God himself died for you and for me so that we could live. And how do you do it? How do you, how do you receive this? Romans 6 tells us in verses 5 to 7, for if we have become united with him in the likeness of death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we could no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is free from sin. The answer is to die. You have to die to yourself. To the world's 
And then you can live in Christ. He has died so that he might offer his life to you. You must die and offer your death to him that he might take the punishment for you and accept the free gift of salvation and live. I encourage you and exhort you if you have not done this. We are coming to an account with our God. Death could be just around the corner. For all we know, death could be around the corner for all of us together at once. Do not go into the presence of God without having turned your heart towards Christ and accepting the life that is in his death. Father, I pray that you would just glorify your name as you have promised to do in the person of your Son, in bringing many sons to glory. And I pray, Lord, that you might take these words as an expert, weak as they are coming from your flesh, and that your Spirit might bless them to reach into our hearts. Let living words strike us between soul and spirit, so that we might, Father, just repent. And I pray that if anyone here is in need of him, Father, work upon their hearts, reveal to them the truth of your Son, and the hope that there is in his death. And have mercy upon us, sinners that we are, and unworthy. That we might receive the glory of Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, we praise your holy name. You've shown us this day what it took for us to be in your presence. We come with hearts of thanks and praise for what has been done for us. And that we have a merciful high priest who pleads his blood for us. We praise your holy name. We pray, Father, that as fellowship happens, as the meal is enjoyed, we pray your blessing. We ask, Father, and we thank you for all the ways you provide for us each and every day. That you've given us daily bread and that you've given us the living bread, eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.